Okay, we, we'll start then, yeah? Is that all right? So welcome everyone. Welcome to the Housing Scrutiny Panel. You all know me, so I'm your new chair, so don't cry just yet. Uh, sorry about the, um, the delay in having the first meeting. I was away for a couple of weeks, so we had to do it on this particular date. And we've kept the agenda short tonight, but as you can see, uh, the next one, we've got the next few meetings, there's, there's quite a bit to go through. So um, I just obviously let you know this meeting is open to the press and the public, and they are entitled to take photographs, films, and record the proceedings as we are, because it'd be on YouTube. Okay, so apologies for absence. So I've received apologies from John Farhi and Miranda Williams. Uh, urgent business. Uh, membership, oh, sorry, Pat. Sorry, Chair, I did want to say, I mentioned it earlier about the director. Unfortunately, he was taken ill during the day. I was in a meeting with him earlier. Uh, I hope he didn't catch anything off me, but he, unfortunately, is not here. Sean is an AD here. Um, for housing and we'll do our best to answer members questions but Jamie is the man across the whole thing so uh, I'll take notes if I can't answer thanks that's fine yeah don't worry so item two urgent business uh, there was a membership error on the front sheet so councillor Taggart Ryan is is not a member of the panel so that would be corrected for the next one uh, any declarations of interest Back soon. Uh, Chair, in relation to future reports being commissioned, I am a trustee of the Greenwich Winter Night Shelter. Thank you, and I'm a council tenant. Okay, so straight on. I'm oh, sorry, Sandra. I'm also a council tenant, although I don't have a garage. Okay, item four is the cabinet member update. Uh, obviously, Jamie's not here, but you're going to answer the best you can. So over to you, Pat. Thanks, Chair. Welcome to your new role and welcome to everybody, the new scrutiny panel, especially Councillor Tester, who's only just rejoined the council. Um, so people know me and Sean will introduce himself properly, but he, he is the Assistant Director for <laughs> Housing and Homelessness. Thank you. Um, so... I do this every year, and um, I've tried to keep it short for you this year. I won't go into it at great length. You've got it. You perhaps read it. I've just highlighted a few things I thought would be worth my highlighting to you. Um, so in terms of the operating context, people will know that um, the housing revenue account has been under strain over the last few years, and um, that is in common with every major council landlord in the country, and we're doing our best to keep our heads above water. We don't know what the new government's terms of engagement will be about that. We are hopeful, and a, an ask has been put in um, to the new government, both by ourselves, but also the 20 biggest landlords in the country. And one of the big things about that ask is around stabilizing our income levels, um, because we haven't had that stability since 2012, I think. Um, with regard to temporary accommodation, I'm pretty sure most of the members around the room know that there was, there's been a significant increase in demand for housing locally, people coming to the council, um, many because they've been evicted by their existing private sector landlord, and we've done our best to help, but it has meant that we were projecting quite significant overspend about November. We picked up on that and um, did some major work which Sean led has been some brilliant work which has included buying new properties for council housing, a hundred in Greenwich Millennium Village, Millennium Village, 33 in Sandy Hill Road, and another hundred coming in GMV next year being built. So that's sort of helping get some churn in the system. Um, 
We've also bought about 100 street properties as well. Recently, very recently, maybe yesterday actually, yeah, it was yesterday the director signed off on us being able to use a hotel in Greenwich wholly just for us, which will help us send fewer families who've got children at school, for example, um, who are in temporary accommodation, sending few of them to Gillingham and Ashford and other parts of Kent. So a lot of major work is going on to try and not only reduce that spend, actually, but um, help local residents uh, have more suitable housing conditions. Ever such a long way to go um, on that. Just briefly on the downsizing pilot, just in terms of it's incumbent on us always to sweat our asset, which is 20,000 council homes, but it's particularly incumbent on us to do that now in the current context of so many people on our waiting list, 23,000 with no priority, 5,000 with priority. And so we've introduced a pilot to really encourage those residents who are under-occupying their properties, of which I'm not sure we have figures, but there are quite a few, probably all members have got one or two people they know who are sitting on three bed, but really don't need that anymore. Um, we had a long time unreviewed amount of money as an incentive. So every bedroom you gave up, you got 350 pounds, which is nice, but hardly life-changing, and we fell behind the norm, really. So for a year now, we're going to have a pilot going forward where we'll give you a 1,000 pounds for every room you give up, as well as help you move and so forth. And we've set up, we've appointed, I think, to an officer, a new role, which will help those people make those decisions and organize those moves. Because a lot of them are of a certain age. And the idea of downsizing after 40 years and getting a skip or doing whatever and then moving is, you know, obviously overwhelming for people. So we've appointed an officer to help them with that. I mentioned the housing register. I mentioned how big it is, how few people on it who are on band C will ever get offered a home or rather will ever be successful in bidding. And we've got, we're working on options to reform that non-priority band, which we will come back to members on in the autumn, early autumn, I think. Rethinking tenancy very quickly. You will know your tenancy enforcement officers. We've been wanting to rethink their role, the numbers of them. They've got the biggest patch sizes in London. Uh, what they, exactly what we want them to do, what is the priority and so on. And we've managed now to secure the resources we need to do a proper uh, transformation program of rethinking tenancy in the coming 12 months or so. You will know that we're now well into our second year of the Repairs Transformation Program, which we set out, I think we started it September 22. Um, so we're nearly into our second year anniversary, and some members will have attended an 18-month update that we gave. Pretty proud of some of the progress we've made. Um, people are not spending hours on the phone now getting through. Um, they can also much more easily book a follow-up appointment with our staff. There's a lot more to come, um, but it's very dependent on two things. One is IT, software. We need to upgrade our software quite significantly to then unleash things, proper things like handheld um, computers for operatives out in the field and hopefully eventually people ordering their own repairs via perhaps an app. The second thing that we're tackling and uh, briefed members on this is the high costs we've got in our direct labor organization which starts us off every year with a, already a two million overspend on that housing revenue account which I've said at the beginning is incredibly pressed. So we continue to try to um, seek a deal with staff on that. Nearly finally, but not quite, capital program, 400 million, five years, being rolled out as we speak. That's improving lots of bits of the existing stock, both lateral, things like lateral mains and lifts, and then within um, people's properties, kitchens and bathrooms. We're trying to, uh, we're changing roofs. 
we are doing our best to decarbonize residents' homes um, and putting in new door entries and the like. And the next two years after that, we'll focus on external estate decoration, which I think people will agree is much required. Just touching back on decarbonization, we are decarbonizing 600 homes in Charlton using money from um, the government as was, and also 21 million of our own money to reduce their carbon emissions. Um, I've talked about 3.4 on page, my page four, which is a HRA sustainability, as I've said, quite a challenge for all of us. Finally, you'll know that I think it was May 22, we self-reported to the regulator that we didn't think we were in compliance with some major components of building safety. They served us with a notice. Ever since, we've been working flat out with our own staff, with subcontractors, to put those things right. And we are very close to doing that. And the regulator says that they are pleased with our progress. We hope they lift that notice also in the autumn. Uh, Chair, I think those are the headlines. Okay, thanks for that. Um, exactly, is, it does say in the operating context that the regulator's coming in to inspect us. Oh, yeah. um, Could you tell us what he's looking for? Yeah, I did sort of highlight that and then I missed it. Um, this is not necessarily absolutely the case, but there seems to be a sense amongst officers and others in the sector that if they, if a regulator lifts a notice, they might, for further assurance, put us into the inspection schedule for that year. Um, the regulator of social housing, this is new re uh, re legislation, Councillor Fletcher, that you may not be fully across yet, which is where there now is an inspection function for all major landlords, maybe above a thousand homes. We've obviously got 20, so we're well into it. And I think they will be inspecting everybody over the years to come, clearly prioritizing according to their sense of um, what the risk is. So I think that the officers think we may be in an inspection regime and they will inspect all of our compliance with tenant satisfaction measures and customer measures and all the rest of it. Thanks, and just one more from me. Um, is, the is the downsizing pilot live now? And do we know if, if it is live, has, has anyone taken it, taken it up? Here? It's no, good question. It isn't live. Um, I might turn to Sean, but I believe we've now appointed, so there was no point in me sending it live because we couldn't manage, but quite soon we will do a pretty major publicity piece because we want those good folks to give up their two big houses for their own good in terms of uh, uh, utility bills and all the rest of it, but principally for those families we've got on our waiting list. You got anything to add, Sean? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Not, not too much to add. We've offered the role to somebody who's an internal applicant and we're hoping they will start later this month. Um, we will, as Pat said, do a big comms campaign about this. Um, and also, I will produce a member briefing, um, <clears throat> which will come to Pat first, and then will come to all members, so that all members will have that information in their surgeries uh, and available to them. Because, yes, we, we see some real opportunities to hugely increase the number of people living in three-bedroom homes, four-bedroom homes, where they are on their own, to free up those homes for the very large number of families that are overcrowded and or are living in temporary accommodation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Pat, for that. And thank you, Sean, for adding the detail there. I had a question, Pat. You mentioned the tenancy officers, and you mentioned uh, that our tenancy officers have got larger patches than anywhere else. Could you please, do you have the information available on how large their patches are and what we're aiming to get them to? <laughs> the other one is a similar numbers question uh, around housing champions. Uh, so the rollout of the housing champions scheme, how successful has that been? Uh, how many estates do we actually have housing champions and how big are patches? So I'm aware that some of them might have blocks of flats with up to 50 flats in them. Are we aiming to get one housing champion per block of flats or are we aiming to get one for an estate of say floor blocks, flats? And the last one is rethinking tendency. You have mentioned that. Um, 
will that be something you'll be dealing with when in the next meeting under uh, tenancy uh, satisfaction measures or will we be receiving a report further down the line on the progress and the philosophy behind the rethinking tenancy strategy thank you thank you councillor saldin um the patch sizes as i recall are somewhere between 900 and 1000 homes which is pretty much accurate. There are about 21.5 tenancy enforcement officers for the 20,000 homes that we own and manage, but those tenancy enforcement officers also do have some responsibilities for our leaseholders as well, of whom there are 5,500 or so. So looked at one way, the patch sizes are well over 1,000, um, and when one takes into account the fact that we've almost never got 100% of the posts covered because there's turnover, the patch sizes are often well in excess of a thousand, and so there's a lot of covering of each other. Um, we're not alone in having difficulties recruiting and retaining staff, um, especially um, since Grenfell, the pandemic, and so on. Recruitment has been incredibly difficult, but the rethink will be looking at um, all of that uh, and seeing what we can do to address that uh, that patch size um, thing. I, I think it's worth mentioning in this meeting. One of the reasons maybe that we have such large patch sizes is that we have the lowest rents of any London borough for our council homes, our council housing, uh, which means that compared to other places with similar size stock, we have far less money coming in to the housing revenue account with which to um, staff up our services. Um, by one calculation, if we'd have had the median rent for London instead of the lowest rent, we'd have had about 16.5 million pounds more in our housing revenue account this year or last year. Uh, not, no, <laughs> um, I mean, we'll be looking at the work hasn't begun in earnest, councillor, um, we'll certainly want a, a work strand of that team project team will be comparator across the piece, um, peers, you know, who've got the same, roughly the same number of um, council properties. So I don't, I wouldn't say we do have a target, but certainly less than that and nearer the London average, I would hope. Partly depends on money. I mean, perhaps if you could tell me what the London average was, that would give me a, a rough idea because I'm right. new onto the panel, so. Okay, I don't know, but I know of quite a few boroughs where there's about 600, six to, uh, but between five and seven hundred, I would say. Uh, housing champions, I'll come back to rethinking tenancy. I don't know when. So I guess we're meeting again. Are we in September? I don't think there have been sufficient work done uh, to come to you with our interim thoughts. Um, so I guess it will be later in the year, Chair. Ha -ha. Right. Oh, sorry, October's the next meeting. I mean, I was very happy to ver verbally update people where we're at, um, but it's not currently on the agenda. E housing champions, I don't know. I have to be honest, I'm not sure exactly how many there are. I think there's somewhere between 10 and 20. Um, they do receive training. Um, they're incredibly um, active and they're very supportive and they're very active on our borough-wide housing panel meetings, one of which is tomorrow night, um, I can most definitely come back to um, the scrutiny panel with some more information about housing champions and be very, very happy to do so. And if there's information which you would like at your disposal to give to tenants, because um, we're always looking for more housing champions. Yeah, let's do an, a reply when yep. you can. A written. I will. Yeah, thank you, Chair. As, as a request, could I ask perhaps if you could just write to the panel with that information, that would be very helpful. Um, and also, uh, just an update of where we are. A one pager, just, you know, even the specification of the rethinking tenancy, you know, what it's designed to achieve, because this will be something that will be important for us to look at. So it'll be helpful for us to have that up front and in our minds. This is a fundamental shift, as I understand it, in the way we're trying to deliver our housing. Um, some time ago, I did run some focus groups, I think online actually, for members. Can't remember if you were there or not, councillor. Um, in which I said, what do you want them to do? What do you think they should do? What's your preference? I confess it was 
over a year ago, so you might have forgotten him. Because um, Sean and his team got waylaid on temporary accommodation overspend. Um, so I think we need to think, we will engage resident, sorry, members again, not particularly necessarily through this group, but we can, but more informally maybe through some more workshops and online foci, focus groups. Yeah, even some notes or minutes from those would be helpful, I think, for us on the panel. Because I, as I understand it, it is quite a fundamental shift that we're seeking to achieve here. So it would be helpful for us as we go through the next two years to actually just have that at the forefront of our minds. I imagine you'd probably agree. <laughs> okay, thanks, Magella. Thanks, Chair. A um, couple of, three very, very brief questions uh, from me as well. I recall um, on previous occasions you have said, talking about the tenancy officers, that you had uh, uh, expressed a view that you were going to recruit more tenancy officers because the number of tenancy officers were too small. Have you recruited tenancy of more tenancy officers and how many? Uh, second, uh, um, question is, um, I've also heard um, about the plans for handheld um, devices and an app, handheld devices for officers and an app for uh, residents. Uh, I heard that some time ago. Uh, and again, we seem to be still talking about it. What is the provisional time scale for introducing that? And thirdly, uh, in terms of the um, uh, negotiations with the direct labour organisation, um, am I to understand from the comments that talks are ongoing, that a, res a resolution has not been uh, arrived at yet? Um, and if so, uh, has the council reassured the union about their concerns over uh, fire and rehire? I know that. Um, there has been a statement from the council to say that there, this was never mentioned, etc. But clearly, uh, Unite the Union have asked for a, um, uh, a reassurance on that. Has that been given? Thank you. Um, have we recruited? So, the, as Sean said, there's 21.5 currently on the establishment tenancy enforcement officers. And we carry vacancies. I don't know the current vacancy rate. Um, I think it is very difficult to recruit them for the reasons Sean said. It's not any more particularly attractive job for people with all the additional responsibilities since Grenfell and so forth. Um, I think we pay about the right amount of money, but that's something also to be looked at. So I don't know what the vacancy rate is. We haven't recruited any more over and above because that's pending the rethink. Yeah. Um, Yes, I share your frustration a little bit about the IT situation, but none of that can be unlocked. I'll try and, this is the only way I understand it. The uh, platform on which a lot of those improvements have to sit, our version of it is, was 26 iterations behind the latest version. So officers have spent, I don't know, months now and still at it, of, and you have to do each improvement, each iteration to get more modern. Uh, can't, put that, can't put that better. Uh, you have to do that uh, iteration one, next improvement, iteration two, until you get to the most modern platform, then it unlocks all these things. But it seems to be taking a long time. I agree. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't expect me to talk too much about the issue, the industrial relations issue. Uh, it, it, the dispute is not resolved. We have given reassurances to the unions and we're looking to the next steps. Any, any other questions? Nez? Hi, thank you, uh, Councillor, and thank you, Sean, uh, for your presentation. Um, on the Rethinking Tenancy um, project, um, I see the words working with the digital team. Does this mean that there may be a reduction in actual physical tenancy officers? Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to remember we're being filmed. Absolutely not. Um, 
when it refers to digital colleagues, actually, we use them in terms of transformational skill set. So they work, they work on the discovery phase where they do masses of research and look at data and they look at the scoping of the project and they bring a whole load of skills to the table. And then we've got service managers and users bringing other sets of skills together. And between the three, they, they do the work of transformation. So it's not about I mean, it might be about improving, giving them PDAs and the like, not sure, but uh, I'll hand over to Sean. Thank you, thanks for the question, Councillor. Um, I think in the context of tenancy, um, certainly we are not looking to reduce the headcount. Um, as, as Pat has said, um, as Magella said herself, uh, if anything, we probably need more because we've got largest patch sizes. What I would speak to is our recent experience of the temporary accommodation cost reduction program, which Pat did mention in her uh, presentation, where we were facing an overspend of roughly 13.5 million pounds by the end of September last year on temporary accommodation. And we launched a program, there's a financial management board put in place, and we did it collaboratively across a whole range of services, including with um, a good amount of digital support. I think, Without the digital support, the program would not have succeeded in the way it did. We reduced the in-year overspend by millions of pounds last year, and this year we're forecasting uh, a further reduction in the millions of pounds. Um, and that's through a whole range of different methods. Some of it is about much better use of IT, of course, and better processes and procedures, um, and using data much more intelligently. But it's, it's very much also about how we relate to homeless people as our customers, as our clients, as our, our citizens and residents and so on, um, because by having a much better relationship with people, you are much um, more likely to be able to help them to achieve a good outcome. So they have a whole range of different skills which we don't have within the service when we do transformation. Um, we could also point, without taking up too much time with the panel, to the Repairs and Investments Transformation Programme, which Pat again mentioned um, in her report, which has brought around incredible change and success um, from a pretty low starting point, if we're honest, um, but digital have been integral to working with repairs and investments and other services to deliver that success too. So I have a lot of belief and evidence that by working with digital, we can bring about much better services for our tenants at <coughs> the same cost, if not less. Um, obviously, that's going to be a huge challenge, but we'll be looking at bits of the service we, we maybe over provide um, because it's not the residents' priorities and bits of service, service where we're under-providing various reasons and just looking to rebalance everything. The world has changed a lot since we reviewed this service last, which was about 15 years ago. Think about everything that's happened since then. Okay, can I just so, uh, Chair, if I could just add, and it, it really has, it is only in the foothills of the work now, but um, an option might be the same number of tenancy enforcement officers, but use any additional cash we've been able to squirrel away to provide them with some small specialist teams that they can hand over to. For example, hoarders take up quite a lot of time. And it's, it, it's understood these days, I think, to be a psychological issue. And tenancy enforcement officers are not necessarily best placed to deal with that. So maybe provide them with specialist advice in that area or in other areas of mental ill health, which gives them an awful lot of work. Um, so it might be that we use the money keep the same number, but give them more specialist support. To honestly, totally open uh, at the moment. Thank you. Um, I'll just reel off two further questions so I don't take up too much of everybody's time. Um, on the project that's the app that hasn't arrived yet for uh, tenants to get their repairs done, and I'm slightly concerned about the digitally excluded older tenants um, or people who don't have access to smartphones or the online. I think there's no replacement for being able to pick up the phone and get someone on the end of it. Um, so I would just like to, I'm seeking assurances that the, the telephone um, center, the call center will not be cut back in a way that I know at the moment with the um, repairs transformation program, it's um, 
not taking as long to get a response on the phone, but obviously I think it's very key that we don't lose that service at all. So can I just ask about what the thinking on, on that is, please? And um, my final question is, um, you've bought, oh, actually, sorry, there's two final questions. First one is, I read about um, rents rising again, rents, rents having to be put up. Can I also ask about service charges? Are they going to have to rise as well? Um, and my final question is the amount of street properties that are being bought. Um, are voids being looked at and also not your department, but the strategic asset review? Is there any sort of holistic working going on to see what properties that are possibly going to be earmarked for disposal um, that could actually be put into use for housing use um, instead of selling to a developer who will convert one of our buildings into flats and either sell it or rent it on the um, private market when we already own it. Is there any scope for that? Thank you. Um, we will never get rid of the phones. And I think I've mentioned occasionally the glamorous life I lead, so quite regularly I ring up. And this morning at quarter to 11, the, the answer was fewer than three minutes to get through. Um, and fewer than one minute on the frontline service desk. So, so they're still super important to our customers and super important to me. So we will always have phones in the foreseeable future. I don't know, about 50 years from now, who knows? Um, 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 it's way too early, I'd say, to talk about rent increases and service charges. It, it, successive governments have nearly always laid down a kind of ceiling, and you can increase them by inflation plus 1% for four years, 2012 to 2016. We uh, we were allowed inflation minus 1%, which is one of the reasons the HRA is in the trouble it's in. So, um, so central government take a view, and then we take a view after that. And I, I guess it tends, I can't try to remember from last year, does it tend to be late autumn that those decisions get taken? Uh, and same for service charges, that will be inflation affected. Um, we have to recoup the costs of our services through service charges, but not make a profit. Uh, with regard to, so I didn't get quite get it cancelled, it was to do with, so there are long-term empty homes that, you know, we kind of go and see if we can get, buy them back, and are they cost-effective and stuff. Is that the sort of thing you meant? <laughs> so first thing was voids. And break voids and bringing those back into use, empty empty properties, um, but also the strategic asset review that's going on. The previous panel I sat on, we covered that, um, and that's obviously a regen. Um, we have we own properties that might be earmarked for disposal. Is there any chance of getting a seat at the table at that strategic asset review and saying that would be perfect for housing? We can convert that because these buildings will get disposed of. Someone will buy them, convert them into residential, and they'll, we'll lose them to the private sector. We could be using those buildings to house our residents in need. So is there any chance of some holistic working between departments on that? Thanks. Uh, I can answer the first bit, and I think Sean would be better off uh, than me answering the second bit. Um, if you mean council housing empty properties, for when you say that, um, we have massively improved performance, I have to say. So I think January 23, it was 480 void properties, which was high. Uh, yesterday, I went to see the voids team at the Birchmere Centre, and it was down to 180. So massively improved, which is great for the folk on the register and great for our coffers. Um, we want to get it down a bit more. But generally speaking, I think it's the norm across... London, maybe the nation, that you're always obviously going to have a small percentage of voids. But our aim is to keep them to the minimum because nobody benefits from them. Yeah, ever so briefly on the strategic asset review question, um, there are properties already coming through to us in the housing service to 
use as permanent social housing. Small numbers so far, um, but as we speak, I'm working on a property which is next school caretaker's house, um, where myself and children's services, well, I didn't go, we've both sent staff to go and have a look at it. Um, it's big enough that it could potentially be a sort, not a children's home, but a home where young people could live as a sort of kind of supported accommodation, uh, which would create enormous savings for children's services. Um, I'm also looking at those properties from the point of view of being a home for an overcrowded family on housing register or living in temporary accommodation. On this occasion, um, I'm, I haven't named the property, so that's okay in a public forum. Um, children's have said it's not right for their purpose, and I've said, I'll have it then. Um, so we will be converting that into a new um, council home in a few months' time. And it, there are other examples, and if, if, if the panel would like numbers, then I can, of course, provide numbers. Okay. Yeah, that'd be good if you could. And I think also I did discuss with uh, Councillor Slattery, didn't I, um, about the panel, if they're free, visiting a void before and after. If, yeah, if that's, if, that's, if, that, if that's something the panel would like to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any more questions on that? Uh, yes, Chair, I've just got a, a clarification from one of the answers that was given about hoarding. Um, you were saying that um, you'd like to, uh, you know, get the tenancy officers to have contact with specialists. I mean, don't you have a hoarding team? I thought the council had a specialist hoarding team. I sure will say more, but I think we certainly have a multi... Is it multi-agency or multi-departmental uh, officer tier group now that discuss cases? Whether well, we could call it a team. Sean, are you able to say? Yeah, there, there are, um, if you like, frontline um, health and adult social care, social workers that will go and visit hoarders and will work with them, make referrals to Oxleys, um, so we will work with those people because I think, as Councillor Slattery said, hoarding is pretty much recognised as a mental health condition in its own right today, which I only learnt myself, I think, less than a year ago. So, of course, mental health experts are involved in the front line. Um, the tenancy enforcement officer's job um, is, A, to form a strong relationship with that tenant alongside the other members of the multidisciplinary team working with that tenant, and then really to keep an eye on them as we work towards a solution um, because social workers don't necessarily have the time to carry out multiple routine visits, but we're going out onto the estates all the time. Um, but what the tenancy enforcement officers um, lack maybe is specialist training in working with people with mental health conditions on such a frequent basis. So it's just a little bit of a training thing really, um, or using new practices that they don't necessarily have the training um, and practice uh, models in place to deliver. So very much, we are doing a lot of work on hoarding. There is a hoarding panel, effectively, and um, myself and Nick Davis, the Director of Adult Services, um, are, are overseeing this piece of work to ascertain what would be as close to the perfect solution going forwards. It's incredibly complex working with hoarders. Um, there's an awful lot of time and money involved in clearing their properties but it's very difficult it's very intrusive to do that to someone and doing that could be something that causes them enormous trauma and so you have to be very careful how you do that so we're just looking at every resource we have available we're looking at national best practice one of the guys working adult services does go around the country talking to other authorities about how they work on hoarding and reads a lot of research about it so later in the year sometime this um, municipal year we may well make a decision about a long-term position and how the tenancy enforcement service fits into that. I think it's a general point about training and how to work with residents with mental health um, conditions because it does seem to be more frequent today than maybe any time for a very long time. And so the staff just need that little bit of extra um, support to be able to, to cope with that and to provide the best possible service to our tenants. Okay, thanks for that, it was good. Okay, so we go to item five, garage update. Thank you, Chair. So at the request of the panel, um, I bring an update on our position on the garages that, that we own. 
um, within our housing estates. Um, so, uh, oh, the slide's not going to be shown, that's fine. Everyone's got, hopefully, the, the paper, the slides in their papers. Yeah, okay, cool. So, my first slide has actually been, I think, kind of um, usurped by, by Councillor Slattery's oh. report, really, because I think it's really important to place the work we do on garages in the context of everything else that we do. Um, so Pat has set out um, what Housing and Safe Communities is doing for our residents, for our tenants. So she spoke of the around about £450 million capital works programme. <clears throat> she spoke of the decarbonisation programme. Um, she talked about everything we're doing to tackle the wider housing crisis, um, which does involve um, the highest number of homeless households that this um, borough has ever been responsible for, which is mirrored across the country. Um, we, I mean, again, Councillor Slattery has talked about the day-to-day -day repairs service, um, but numerically speaking, um, we delivered more than 65,000 responsive repairs last year, um, and are likely to do similar, if not more, this year. Uh, we've talked about the need to rethink tenancy services, uh, the work we do to collect rent without taking punitive measures against people who are struggling to pay their rent, but to be much to be very supportive to those residents um, and effectively help some very, very vulnerable people sometimes to live independently in their homes. Uh, and also there's a lot of work, um, unfortunately, responding to antisocial behaviour. We, we have about a thousand cases of antisocial behaviour open at any one time. Um, I could also mention, I think Councillor Slattery might have done, although I'm not sure, damp and mould, obviously, since, since the tragic death of Ara Bishak in, in uh, Rochdale um, several years ago. There's been a sudden need, which probably was long overdue, to do much more about damp and mould. We're now delivering, I think it was uh, over 1,700 mould washes a year, and that number would have been a fraction of that a few years ago. So I suppose my point is that we're ramping up, we have ramped up and significantly transformed what we're doing um, for, our, for our tenants. And most of that, not surprised on the back of Grenfell as well, is about people's homes. So garages hasn't featured as a high priority. So that's where we are, that's just a fact. Um, that doesn't mean we don't see how important garages can be to residents with cars, um, and we don't see the value in our stock. We have quite a large stock of, of garages, um, and <clears throat> we would like to do more. So we have made an undertaking in the medium term financial strategy for the housing revenue account, which is um, set out in the next slide. So the commitments we've made <clears throat> for this year that we're now in, um, which will be reviewed, and obviously we can make we can make changes next year potentially, but the commitments, commitments this year are to return 150 void garages back into use and get them let, which would generate around about £100,000 um, additional income this year. Um, we did increase garage rents for the second year running from an incredibly low starting point I joined in March 2023, so I wasn't here um, for what the, uh, the costs were before that. Um, but we increased the garage rents by £1 for each garage in April of this year to £11, £13 and £15. So our most expensive garages cost £15 a week or £780 per year, um, which is still significantly lower than quite a lot of other London um, council landlords. Um, but nonetheless, it is an increase and it hits people in, in the pocket at a time when there's a cost of living crisis. One of the things that does do, it does generate additional income, around about £68,000 we anticipated um, to the housing revenue account. And part of that income um, is allowing us to recruit a new post. So we don't have anyone whose full-time job or even part-time job is garages. We just don't, it just, that's a statement of fact, doesn't exist. We don't have a garage team, we don't have a garage officer. We don't have anyone dedicated to garages. That's, that's the fact as, as things stand. So the strategy is we're going to recruit a garages project manager um, and their job will be to um, take a really detailed look at what the current situation is, um, assess the possibilities, provide options and suggest a long-term strategy. And that's this year's um, commitment um, in terms of actually um, doing garages this year, as I said, it's to return 150 void garages back into use this year. Next slide. Not there, not there, up there. Okay, so how are we doing so far this year? We have 
um, turned around 21 void garages, 11 of which have been let. I mean, this was a few days ago. It's probably increased by now. Um, and the other, the other 10 were, when we did that bit of data, in the process of being let. Um, it is still the case that the current scope of work is limited to minor repairs to make the gar garage functional. We don't have uh, an all-seeing, all-dancing, um, as I say, team function strategy approach for garages. That's where we are. Um, we've already kind of started work on a provisional draft policy um, because we have been looking at this um, in recent years and we've, we've looked at other best practice around London and so on. So we have a pretty shrewd idea of what a draft policy would look like, um, but the garages project manager will come in um, and take a much more in-depth and focused look at that. Um, on the recruitment of the garages project manager, uh, we have written a job description and person specification uh, from scratch, and that is currently with HR being evaluated. So I'm trying to get that uh, sorted as soon as possible, get them in post and get, get things happening. So the next slide sets out what they will do. So they're going to be tasked with evaluating our existing processes, including letting, voids management and repairs. Um, and also I would add to that kind of managing the waiting list, which I'll talk about a little bit later. There's, there's a lot of work involved in this, a hell of a lot. Um, the project manager will be reviewing non-Greenwich build sites, considering options on a site-by-site -site ba site, site -site basis um, to help develop a program of works. We don't have a program of works at the moment and um, help with delivering item three, item three being um, having better data about our garages. So we need to validate the data held on our garage stock on our NEC database, uh, improve the data we hold uh, and improve the way in which we report on and manage the performance on garages. Um, point four, research and report on different methods for garage management. Um, unsurprisingly, landlords deal with garages in very different ways. Councils do, housing associations do. We know some councils will do this in-house. We know that some councils will use specialist companies who do garage management. Um, and I have seen examples of where that seems to be done quite well. So we're open to how we could do this in the long run more effectively. Ultimately, we would like the garages project manager to write a, a cost deed. And that's obviously very crucial given the pressure on the housing revenue account garage management strategy slash policy based on the research that he or she has done, the best practice that he or she has um, observed and give us options for how to fund um, the strategy, the delivery of the strategy, in fact. Um, and then the, uh, the garages project manager will monitor and report on commitments made for garages under our NTFS at as things stand. So that's obviously crucial, um, having that garage manager post up and running. The next slide is headed the great garage dilemma. So clearly we would want um, our garages to be in use by people who want to use them. We want the income to be coming in. Um, we don't like <laughs> when we go onto our estates seeing garages in a shocking state of disrepair being used for unofficial storage, AKA fly tipping. When I went to visit a, an, an estate that I won't name early on in my career here, there was a garage being used by people taking illicit, well, illegal substances. Um, and it wasn't, I could just imagine living there. And that's what I'm confronted by. So we know, we know that garages is a big issue and it does need to be resolved. Um, we, know also that garages could be put to different uses. Um, it isn't just um, for cars, potentially they can be used for storage. They could be used for commer by commercial companies for storage, for example, um, not just of cars obviously, but of, uh, of uh, things that need to be stored that cost an awful lot more to store in the private sector. So there's different options for our garages. Some could be redeveloped, some could be demolished and so on and so forth. Um, a much better use made of them. What are the barriers to this? Um, so it is major work to, to deal with derelict, dilapidated garages. It's major works. Um, it's not just a sort of lick of paint, um, as you'll probably imagine, and there's asbestos in quite a few of them. Um, the next bullet point, point down is quite salient, really. A new garage door costs about a thousand pounds. And a lot of our garages, when we go to look at them, do need new garage doors. We're charging £11 a week in tier one, the cheapest tier, that's it, tier three, 
The cheapest tier is £11 per week. It would cost nearly two years. It would, it would take nearly two years of receiving that £11 a week to pay off one door. Um, so there's a huge financial challenge here. Um, one of the barriers is, you know, one, one could say, well, increase the charges on garages, which we have done two years running. They're still amongst the lowest in London. But obviously every time we do increase charges for anything that our tenants use, um, that could be pricing them out of having the garage. It could cause them more financial difficulties and so on. So we have to be very careful about increasing prices. We've increased rents two years running um, and constantly increasing the cost of everything, the price of everything is something we're always very, very uh, reluctant to do. We are looking to see whether the most recent price um, changes or increases have affected garage use. We know 32 garages were, were handed back to us between 31st of March and 12th of June, but going back to the data point, as in the garage project manager needing to help us improve our uh, data on garages, we don't know why they're handing them back. Because obviously it's a, it's a uh, question I think Councillor Slattery asked me. Um, what has been the impact of the price increase on garages? And we cannot tell you the answer at this time. Uh, other barriers, um, uh, the panel probably won't know, a lot of our garages are simply too small for modern vehicles. Uh, you know, if you think about when they were built and what cars were like then, um, and now we've got HGVs and four-wheel drives and all that stuff, uh, a lot of people's cars won't literally fit in the garages that we've got. Um, other barriers, as I've mentioned, a lot of our void garages have, are used for effectively fly tipping. And there's, there's an example of where my caretaking service had to remove 10.5 tonnes of rubbish from a, from a garage. Uh, that cost us a lot of money um, and equated to 21 van loads of, uh, of uh, removal of, uh, of that rubbish. Um, it's not really a barrier, but Greenwich builds as such. Um, Across Greenwich builds, we've identified, I think it's around about 400 garages, which by basically taking them out of use as garages, will allow us to build more homes for people. Um, so it's not really a barrier, but it's more the number of garages we've got will go down because of that. The number of garages we've got will also go down if the solution to the size problem is to make them bigger because the only way to make them bigger is actually to reduce the number. Um, so there's a lot of very difficult decisions to make. Um, and if, and if, if the panel would like a list of the Greenwich build sites where garages have been um, cited for uh, being impacted by Greenwich builds, then I can provide that. We've got that list. Okay. So what are our options? Um, again, this is pending the garage project manager starting, uh, she or he may have other options that we just haven't thought of yet. Um, we could concentrate on integral garages, which won't be used for Greenwich builds. Um, we could reconfigure garages, making them larger, but that would reduce the number of units. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we could allow garages, well, I say allow garages, the policy could say one of the options for garages is storage purposes um, and potentially the charges for storage, um, especially if done commercially, could be higher than the charges are for our tenants to park their cars in them, um, but they could be used as storage for our, for our tenants as well, but obviously not at a higher cost. Um, uh, yeah, commercial lets for certain garages, <coughs> um, options, well it's not an option, we would need to consult residents on their needs and aspirations for garages, we, d we definitely will um, be asking residents questions about this in due course once the garages project manager is in place and it's the right time in the project because um, we need to know um, what the residents around the entire borough think. We know that the views will be very different depending where people live, we know that. Um, and ultimately develop an alternative management model. So an alternative management model is, well at the moment we don't have a management model, but consider the alternatives. One alternative is we manage it in-house of course. Um, another model is that we outsource it to uh, a specialist company um, who's been doing this for years. It is an option we will have to consider. And then pretty much the final slide before next steps is some of the numbers. Um, so 35% of our garages are currently let, um, which, is, which equates to about 1,200, which are actually let at the moment. 
um, and we want to let 150 more over the course of this year, as I've said. Um, the price, I've already said, £11, £13 or £15. Uh, you're probably wondering what is the difference between an £11 garage and a £15 garage. And I think that's somewhat lost in the mists of time. It's about, the, the, I don't know what it's actually about. It's more, it's about the attractiveness of the location, the attractiveness of the garage. It's kind of something that hasn't been looked at for a very long time. And it's something the garage's project manager will look at, um, whether we're, we're charging the right, or should it be just the same cost for every garage across the whole of the borough? Um, but I'm told it's quite a, an, an old kind of policy, that one. Um, 65% of our garages are let to leaseholders or freeholders. We don't know exactly how many to leaseholders, how many to freeholders. Um, we obviously want to let garages where the demand is, is to ensure we make the most of these assets. Um, but the priority would always be to our tenants, our own tenants. And we have 3,465 garages, which is a very, very significant number. But as I said, only 35% are actually let at the moment. Some other numbers which aren't in the slides, there's about 1,500 um, on the waiting list. Um, I cannot tell the panel how accurate, realistic, up-to-date, contemporary, etc. that waiting list is. Um, I cannot say to the panel it's a very well-managed, maintained, performance-monitored waiting list <clears throat> and it is in fact closed at the moment, new applications, unless someone's got an urgent need for a garage. Um, and so to put a number to how many are not let, that's 2,274. Um, something else that's not in the slide is the total income that we, we anticipate getting from garages this year is about £900,000. So next steps, um, we aim to deliver 43 garages, new lets per quarter to hit our medium term financial strategy target for this year. We're going to recruit the garage project manager I say going to, we hope to recruit, because recruitment is, is slightly harder these days than it's really ever been before, but we want someone in post by October this year. Um, and we aim to have a policy proposal quite quickly after that person starts uh, for consultation by January of, of next year. And that is it from my presentation. Lovely, thanks for that report. Um, just a couple of quick questions from me. Um, I suppose if we're looking at storage, uh, renting them out for storage, which I think is the way to go, actually, because I think there's a good income from that, is we'd have to be pretty safe on fire regulations on that. Um, also, would it, when renting a garage, I know a lot of um, people are leaving garages full of rubbish, as you were saying. Um, is, there, is there any way we can charge a deposit? So as and when they hand the garage back, we can go and inspect it, and if the garage door's hanging off, they lose their deposit. Uh, and the um, residents been asking me is where they're going to lose their garages to Greenwich New Build. Can they be put on the list higher for a garage elsewhere? Thanks, Chair. So taking your questions and comments in reverse order, there is a prioritization system for how we allocate the garages, and so I'm gonna go through them, actually, if that's okay with the panel, and that will say where the last case scenario fits in. So group A, the highest priority, is any um, household where there are tenants or leaseholder, and there is a disabled person within the household for whom the car would be um, an advantage. Um, group B is where garages are being demolished or are unrepar unreparable. So where Greenwich Bills <coughs> is, as part of uh, the scheme, going to be taking away garages from access to tenants, they would be priority B for allocation to another garage. Uh, um, it may be helpful to plan if I carry on through the priorities as well, just so um, that's been done. Group C is where a tenant is suffering from, and I'm not exactly sure what, what this is, car-related hate crime or domestic violence, but I suppose it's about having the ability to park one's car somewhere safe, get to the car safely, and so on and so forth. So um, I think it's quite a thoughtful um, priority group. Um, priority D is council tenants leaseholders living nearest the garage. And then we've got E1 and E2. 
where we start to bring in um, <clears throat> people who are not our own tenants or leaseholders. So E1 is a household with a disabled member, but they're not a Greenwich tenant or leaseholder. E2 is all other Greenwich borough residents. F is live outside the borough. I can't imagine we ever get to some of these groups. And then G is where somebody wants a second garage. <laughs> so someone thought that through a lot, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> I'm sure we don't get beyond C very often. I wouldn't have thought <laughs> oh, D. And then, so in reverse order, I'm now, the brilliant idea about deposits, um, Chair, thank you. Um, I, I don't think we charge deposit at the moment. I'm fairly sure we don't. Yeah. It sounds like a good idea, as, as long as it's not too much. Um, and pleased to hear that you uh, you think that storage could be a viable option. Did I miss it? Did I miss any of your points, Chair? No, no, I didn't. Oh. No, actually, no. And I do know a resident actually that's going to lose a garage, but I can relay the information on about being priority B for a new garage because she suffers car crime. They're constantly breaking her windows, so she's got a garage. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Councillor Thomas. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I was just interested to try and understand why our rents are so much lower than everybody else's. I kind of can't wrap my head around that. And the other thing um, that does concern me is that something that's income, generated, income generating has been left to just wither on the vine. And now the work that needs to be undertaken to bring them back into good condition is going to cost more than it would have done had we have done this sooner. And lastly, um, in terms of the manager, the manager role, the project manager, um, you said that it's sort of quite crucial work. So I'm wondering why it's just a 12 month gig in that case and what will happen to all this body of work at the 12 month point if that role is uh, not continued. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. So again, in reverse order, Garage's project manager ostensibly will um, help us decide what the long-term future looks like. So we will potentially need dedicated staff, um, but we won't necessarily need a project manager. We'll need people that deliver. So for example, we could need someone to manage the waiting list, the allocation and the lettings process. Um, and then we might, we'll need other people to actually deliver the repair works, uh, the redesign, <coughs> and so on and so forth. So th the project manager position won't be needed anymore because they'll have set, set us up for the future. Um, if they want to stay on in a different role, that, that'd be fine. But they're, they're reviewing, they're making suggestions. They're not operational as such. They're not, they haven't come in, they're not coming in to deliver 150 void garages back into use this year personally because there isn't a system for them to do that personally, if you see what I mean. There's an existing system for that. So 12, month, 12 months should be long enough for us to get from that post what we need, which will be a long-term future, um, and hopefully um, staff to, to deliver that. Why has, the, why has it been left to wither on the vine? Um, I can't really speak to that um, because I've only been here yeah, A, I've only been here since March last year, but I just think it hasn't been a priority compared to improving our aging stock um, and to trying to kind of provide more housing and do all the things which Pat has mentioned in her report and, and I mentioned a bit earlier on. So housing, the home, has I think been seen by preceding um, officers and administrations as the priority, whereas the garage, which isn't someone's home, has been seen as a lower priority. Um, I guess, I'm sure there's much more complexity than that to it, but the priority has to be people's homes, I think, or has had to have been, and now maybe we can move on to garages as well. I welcome other comments on that. And why, why are our rents so low? Um, and again, having only been here since March last year, I genuinely don't know why Greenwich has got literally lowest um, rents in London. Uh, neither do I. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I suspect decisions made before any of us were elected, actually. Um, and if you consider as well, we've got the lowest rents for homes in London. It's obviously something that our predecessors um, wanted to have as a policy and um, and obviously it's a policy that you could say we should be proud of. Um, but I think unfortunately that it does build up problems in the system then if we haven't got, we're very proud of having low rents and low garage rents, but we can't, <laughs> it means we can't do our job properly. So that's what um, I've been trying to pick up on since I became cabinet member really is to see both sides of that coin. So I'm only guessing, Councillor Thomas, by the way, why they're so low. Um, but I'm guessing, well, I know that this project manager will absolutely have to look at what is possible in other boroughs. Not only what they are, but what they collect as well. Because some people will be put off. Because, what, 15 quid, that's 60 quid a month. Um, if we charge much more than that, maybe people won't want them, don't know. But that's all the work that's got to go on. I don't think many people use them for cars anymore. Does anybody? My impression always is they're pretty much for storage, which I think is fine, especially some of the smaller, like on your patch, Councillor Anning Meridian, some really small properties with narrow balconies. I don't think it's unreasonable if people want to use them for storage. Taking your point about fire safety, though, Chair. Yeah, Councillor Scott. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Sean and Pat again. Um, Sean, just on the, uh, I mean, the, the low. I, I'm actually quite surprised that it's only 35% of the stock is let, and it is an income generator, and people do need garages. Um, there's um, a big block of garages in my ward, Plumster Common, and it's just sitting there rotting, and it's a terrible waste. Whether that will be earmarked for Greenwich Bills, I don't know, but it's um, something needs to be done with them, um, and hopefully they'll be part of this project. Um, but can you tell me, uh, you've told, you said 65% of the 35% that are let are let to leaseholders um, and freeholders. Um, but are any of our garages actually owned by leaseholders? Historically, have they come with a flat and when the flat was sold through right to buy, the garage went with it? Um, I asked because there was a situation in my ward where I actually asked the question, how many of these garages are privately owned? Or how many of these do we own? And the plan came back to me, but it, it wasn't correct at all. Um, but I was under the impression that some garages actually are privately owned. But from your presentation, it doesn't look like any are. Oh, it's like we own all of them. Can you clarify that for me? The honest answer is I can't clarify that for you immediately, but I will. Mm. Thank you. Um, and just on the, the, the rent levels, I understand about affordability and cost of living, um, but I am surprised at how low, low the rents are as well. Um, and I wondered whether there, would, there could be a formula for which rents are, like you've got bands of prior, you've got priority bands for who gets the garages. Could there be priority bands for charging? So if you're in band A uh, or C or E1, you have a lower rent. If you're in band F or G, you, there's, you get charged a higher rent. Yeah, I mean, so there are, there are differentials at the moment. It's 11, 13 and 15 pounds per week which, uh, as I say, I, I can't really ascertain how it's decided what's in what band, and I think it's very historical stuff, to be honest with you. So when we look um, to transform the garages um, service, that's absolutely something we will, we will be looking at in the options appraisal. Absolutely, Councillor, thank you. Yeah. And I'd just like to ask about um, demand. Uh, demand for the garages is obviously a big waiting list, and I think we all know a lot of them are used for storage and that these points have already been made. 
Um, but we're at a point where permit parking is going to come in in a lot of areas, if not everywhere. Demand for those garages will be high, even higher. So it's an opportunity to reset the bar with the income generated, if you know what I mean. Because if people want them, you could charge more for them. I don't want to charge people who can't afford um, a garage, who are a family, a struggling family. I don't want to charge them more. But if somebody wants to rent one of these garages at the moment, especially with the controlled parking coming in, it seems like an opportune moment to really relook at these rents. And my final point is just on the, um, I mean, I know a lot of these are 60s built, 70s built, and modern cars won't fit in them. Um, and you were mentioned about perhaps um, reconfiguring the garages to make them bigger. You'd have to do the depth, wouldn't you? Not, I mean, you could make them wider, but the, the trouble with um, those garages is when you drive into them, the, they just won't fit the length of a modern car. Um, even something that's called a mini <laughs> these days won't fit into it. So they'd have to actually be lengthened as well as widened in a lot of cases. So, but I'm sure the garage manager will, will know that. But it's just a, just a thought, thanks. That's a really astute observation. And I guess um, there'll be a difference between widening and potentially deepening. And deepening might, might not be cost effective under any circumstances. So. Ultimately, what we need is, is a site-by-site -site appraisal of all the garages in the borough, which is a huge undertaking when there's in excess of 3,000 of them, but that is what we need. Um, every, you know, garages are very unique, um, very different shapes and sizes, and in very different conditions, as you, as you so rightly said. So, yeah, creating bigger units might only be possible in certain um, si situations and not in all. Um, going back to your previous point um, about the short answer is that we're obviously mindful of the parking strategy for the borough. Um, we've got emissions-based um, parking charges now. Um, we have our own approach to charging for parking on our own estates. Um, and at the moment, we're kind of making sure that we're mindful of the borough's parking strategy um, in comparison with our own approach to charging for parking on our estates. And anything that might drive people um, to want garages, we need to be mindful of. So your point is extremely well made, and it absolutely could drive demand for garages. So hopefully the work we're going to do will marry up with, with that, if that is one of the impacts of the new approach to parking um, in, in the borough. Um, I can't meet, read my own writing there. Oh, the, uh, we... we Oh yes, so I'm, I will come back with um, the proper answer to that. Yeah, uh, and, and as we said, the, char the charging structure will be reviewed by the garages project manager and will be um, obviously rethought and included in options when, when we come to make decisions about it eventually. Councillor Annie. Thank you, Chair. This is one of these situations where there appears to be a lack of joined up thinking in the various policies of this council. One of them is to achieve net zero by 2030. But in this uh, context, we're talking about how to bring on more garages into service. So it's a bit confusing. I understand you make money from the garages, so therefore, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a money-making um, operation, but it is also go, is contrary to the concept of getting uh, more cars off the road. And that is also what the new parking uh, strategy is, to get more cars off the road. And our, all new developments that are being built in this borough are now car free except for uh, disabled and um, uh, 
there is a small number of car spaces allocated in developments which have large families. But on the other hand, that's the regeneration department and then the net zero department. But this department is looking to bring more garages on, on track. Now, I can see that you want to make money from them. But as you can see from the point of view of all of the, the different policies of the council, there is a contradiction there. Have you taken that into account? Have you uh, uh, talked with your colleagues uh, on the net zero um, operation? Have you discussed this with um, uh, the uh, department looking at uh, young people and sport, etc.? Because it's quite clear that some of these these areas could actually be used for activities for young people, for youth clubs. They would obviously have to be demolished, but there is space there on estates. And I do not see why people who do not live on these estates, you know, will be renting these, have the right to rent these garages. Why? They're not living there. It Surely there should be a priority only for tenants and only for those tenants who need them. Now, again, we've got the contradiction that you need the money, the council needs money, um, and so this is a, a money-making operation if you can get more garages into operation. But it is a total contradiction to, on our policies, on our publicly stated government uh, council policies on net zero. Thank you, councillor. So, um I think, again, in reverse order. So people not living on the estates um, are a very low priority and I think are very rarely allocated garages. Um, the priority groups I can include in, in something I say around after the meeting, but I, I did go through them. We are seeking to maximise the use of the garages we've got. I di haven't suggested, the report doesn't suggest, and we're not suggesting we build any garages. Uh, everything suggested in the report is actually reducing the number. So where Greenwich builds are going in, <coughs> demolishing garages, uh, and instead putting up homes, um, that's about 400 garages um, being taken out of the, of the system through that alone. It's actually more than 400. Um, creating larger garages by knocking two together reduces the total number of garages. Um, deliberately allowing storage in our garages, they're for cars, they are used for storage, but that's not really in the policy as a policy option, we are looking at um, in the future saying garages are something that can be used for storage instead of cars, reduces the number that are used for cars. So all of those things actually, so maybe my report wasn't clear enough. We're looking to make better use of the garages we've got. We're looking to rethink how they are used. Um, we do have to be mindful of demand and I know that a lot of the policy measures we're taking are absolutely about reducing dependency on cars, reducing our carbon footprint, um, and we are mindful of that. I think the, the best example is Greenwich Builds has been signed off, and in signing that off, 400 garages are taken out of the system. And I'm absolutely sure that will be in, in perfect alignment with, with the borough's strategy on car use. Um, the other options um, do fit into that, but I, I couldn't say We've sat down and looked at um, the carbon zero policies and taken them into the garages policy, but that's something we are going to be working on in the next year. So I hope that you can see, but I mean, that, and that is your point of view, which is very valid. There may well be other points of view, which are, we want more garages. And I'm not saying those people are right or, or wrong or any of those things. It'd be nice to settle on the right number eventually. Um, some people might say it's zero. I don't know. Um, other people might say it's more than we've got at the moment. I don't know. Um, but in answer to, to what you did say, I would say 400 fewer garages due to Greenwich builds would seem to tie in with the um, you know, zero car developments that we are doing on some of our new build schemes and does therefore fit into the, the carbon zero um, work that we are doing. Lovely, thanks. Any more questions? No? So when it's just, just being really cheeky now, so when the uh, chap comes in, who's, or lady who's gonna look at the garages, 
I suppose they'd look at sheds as well, but we can always come back to sheds at another, <laughs> at, at, at another day. Yes. Okay, so thanks for that, and thanks, thanks for the report. Okay, you don't have to stay for the next bit, but you can, Councillor. You, if you want to, it's up to you. It's, it's only a couple of... Yeah, go on then, why not? So item six is, six is the work programme schedule. Members to note the 24, 25 work programme items to agree to scope. I've got a question, Chair. Yep. Um, meeting number six, in-depth review, zero carbon retrofit. Right, so there's a history to this. Do you know the history to this? Uh, no. Okay. Um, David Gardner, who was a member of this committee um, until this year, and I uh, volunteered to um, uh, lead a um, review into the zero carbon retrofit. Um, we only got started late in the day because um, uh, there was a little bit of difficulty in getting certain levels of support that we needed. And I had done some original research, uh, initial research, and um, Councillor Gardner had done some um, scoping. So he's no longer on this committee. But we do seem to have this on the list here. And I'm just wondering where it's going to appear. How is it going to appear? Is it, it, does, this, does this item refer to the in-depth review that we had planned or is this a totally independent item? That's what I'm asking. So it won't be something that councillors will be responsible for initiating. It will be officers. It's your, obviously, this is your work program. I'm aware of Councillor Anning, what she's saying about her and Councillor Gardner. Yeah. Kind of reads like that's what it's going to be, but it's obviously going to be worth checking. On last year's programme, it was down as a task and finish um, project, so outside of the set meetings. I think that's what Councillor Anning's referring to. So I think Councillor Anning and Councillor Gardner were working on that as a separate piece of work. I think, I think, because I remember it being a task and finish outside of the normal meetings. We haven't started the report yet, Chair, because we, as I said, we did not think that we received the appropriate support for it. And uh, David Gardner is no longer on this committee, so there's just little old me. And if someone would like to uh, take part in it with me, I would be very happy to do, you know, to, to work on it, at least one other councillor or perhaps two. Uh, Chair, yeah, I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to join. Uh, Councillor Anning on working on that. Okay, good. Thank you. You're more than welcome. So are we agreed then that that is actually a, a councillor-led review? Yes, you can, you can, you can uh, yeah, you can, yeah, you can. Re Unless there was some other meaning to that. We'll have a repairs item. update, but you can go first and, yeah. Or you could just update us on what you're working on, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. We'll I'm talking about there. 10th of April. Sorry? I'm talking about the 10th of April. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. It's quite a way away, isn't it? So you'll probably do quite a bit. In well, the... I would have expected that we could produce a report by the 10th of April. I've already got some outlines on it, and I think we can easily re produce that report. Uh, and that would include, and what we had planned, was to have the committee um, visit uh, um, some sites in Greenwich where uh, the best practice can be found and um, also outside of the borough. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the only one concern I had was when Councillor Anning mentioned that they might not have had the support previously. 
Uh, so with the cabinet member in the room, I'd like to ask her if she'd be willing to uh, throw away behind us and guarantee us whatever support we need in order to complete the report. I thought, I don't know which pair of glasses to put on this one. I, <laughs> scrutiny support is not always my officers, is it? Nawane, can you, a Lucy or somebody? <laughs> I think what the best approach would be is to let Lakshane and Magella get together and then I'll meet with them and they can say what the report yeah, is. Yeah, see before. what the methodology is. Because, because I don't want to sit here and go, yeah, we're going to do A, yeah. B and C and then go to the door and go, can we have X yeah. amount? And they go, no, go away. Yeah. So, and also the officers that we would lend to it are the officers whose work you'd be reviewing. Mm. So I don't, I, it, just in my ignorance, not, I've only yeah. been here two but years. Absolutely so looking, going out and on the site visits and looking at Beck's yeah, best yeah, practice yeah. is a great yeah. idea, I think. Yeah. We've already had Zooms with Jamie and others. It, it's already, it, there's already been some um, groundwork done and an outline of, of the criteria, et cetera. All of that is, uh, is, is there. Um, and uh, we would require uh, help from officers uh, to provide us with uh, certain background information, uh, things that, that would fill our report, um, I, I, and then we would then um, look into the further, um, uh, you, you know, um, best practice uh, criteria that we can find from around London, for example, and we can comment on that. Okay, so it's best if... I come back to that and I'll, I'll speak to member support to see what what is available and what isn't. And if you speak to Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I don't want to under-promise, but neither do I want to over-promise <laughs> in the absence of my um, officers. So, um, yeah, maybe Councillor Fletcher, you could find out stuff and then you and I could have a chat. Chair, if I may, just to put the cabinet member's mind at rest, this will largely be, certainly when I asked the question, I meant in terms of data, availability, and progress information. Where I've worked on these things in the past, sometimes there's been a, a, reluctant, a reluctance to provide the task and finish group with the information that we're asking for. So if we're asking for, you know, how many units did you plan to do and how many have you done so far, we'd expect an answer to that. And sometimes I understand there's been some reluctance to not obviously in relation to this, but where other task and finish groups have tried to get that information, there's been a reluctance to provide it. And it'd be good to have the uh, cabinet members uh, heft and shoulder behind it. Uh, if you get any difficulty accessing data that, should, that you should have access to, then 100% I'll be behind you because there is no point in scrutiny if you don't have the information. <laughs> As long as it's a leveled approach, yeah. As long as it's a level approach. Level approach. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's information that they require, but not information that's... I don't want officers coming back and going, they're spending 24 hours a day working on... Yeah, but so... You mean proportionate? Yeah. But, yes. Yeah. But I'm, no, I'm just, yeah. Yeah, proportionate. I'm just, I'm just putting up, yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred percent. But I'm happy to discuss it. Both, yeah, a hundred percent. Because, as I said, the people that we're likely to be able to uh, uh, release to help you are the people who are doing the work of uh, decarbonising. So, you know, it would be an own goal if they couldn't decarbonise because they're giving data to everybody. But I feel sure this has been covered off before. So, but yeah, let's talk about it. Thanks. So item seven is commissioning a future reports. Members to note the work items that are scheduled. Oh, sorry, Naz. Cool. Thank you, Chair. Just got a point on that one. Um, so for the next meeting, um, 17th of October, um, commissioning the reports, just within the tenant, tenant satisfaction measures, I wondered if we could have a repairs update in that as well, because I think repairs are, are such a big part of tenant, tenant satisfaction. I know there's a repairs update for the 10th of April, but that's a quite a way away um, and I think this is a pertinent issue all, all year round so if that could form part of that to have a repairs update within the tenant satisfaction measures that would be really helpful. 
The tenant satisfaction measures are something very specific the regulators laid down, which everybody's got to report on. We've just reported our first years, um, and you'll see that quite soon with comparator data and all the rest of it. And it of course, it encompasses repairs, because repairs drive satisfaction, by and large, a lot, don't they? Um, and I'm always very happy to say a few words about repairs update. There is the governance from the Repairs Transformation Program is the Repairs Transformation Board, of which sits Sandra amongst about five others. So I don't want to over-governance it, but always happy to chuck in a verbal on, on where we are. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, me again. Uh, just on the basis that, as Councillor Asgar has pointed out, it is so important. Would it be worth tabling that as, I mean, I, I presume, Councillor Slattery, you receive a monthly report on these, on the repairs, progress and update, backlog, etc. Would it be worth on tabling that as an item just to be presented to the committee uh, at each meeting, the most recent uh, status of repairs that the Cabinet member has? What, just a written report? No, no, just as a, a small piece. Yeah, just as a standing item. I presume Councillor Slattery gets a dashboard or something yeah. monthly. Just have that presented to us. We can then enter that into our own. Well, do we need it presented questions. or we can just have it for our information? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, daily, by the way, not monthly. Um, I mean, I'd rather do a verbal, I must admit, if that is okay. And it depends. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe um, you could scope exactly. So, for example, you might want to know the voids level, um, uh, contact centre data, where we are with the PDA and the thing. Maybe you could sketch out a few, five or six key things you'd want to know each and every time you meet. Very happy to provide. Okay. Chair, in the first instance, I presume you've got some key performance indicators that you manage your, you monitor your officers' performance against. If we could just have a sight of those key performance indicators in the first instance at our next meeting, I imagine they'll probably be fine. Uh, but then if they're not, we can always ask for more. And if it's unreasonable, you can always say that's unreasonable and explain to us why. But I think that just the KPI visibility would be useful for us given it's such an important issue to our residents. Yep. yep, sounds good. Okay, everyone. Well, thanks for everyone for coming. That was good fun. Cheers.